nice we have 15 uh, work, uh, <coughs> waiting yeah so hello everyone uh thank you so much for joining us today uh this is a new meetup organized by uh tunis our user group uh so this is just a sort of introduction about our group so you are a run volunteer uh, a network uh this network is like composed of uh, three passionate ladies about uh, r so i'm Mune Bilaid. um i'm a business intelligence data uh, consultant and uh along with uh, Amal Lili, who is a data science engineer, and with Hediat Nani, who is a post-doctoral uh, uh, fellow at the Pasteur Institute of Tunis. Uh, so you aim to provide like a friendly support network for our users, not only in Tunisia, but also worldwide. Uh, so as you know, there are different um, our user communities worldwide, and uh, you are so pleased to be part of, um, of this uh, so community. Um, so uh, just you have a code of contact. Let's just keep making this uh, this place the environment. I know you are now live on YouTube. Uh, this environment as uh, as well, a welcoming one as possible. Um, yeah. So today's meetup is part of the one package per meetup series that you have started uh, since a few yeah a few months ago. Uh, today uh, you are so pleased pleased to be hosting Thomas Lim Pedersen. So um, he will cover um, how to explore uh, tidy network data using the tidy graph uh, package in R. Uh, so Thomas, Thomas sorry, is a software engineer at R Studio. Uh, he's fo focusing on uh, developing and maintaining uh, various packages that makes data this possible in R. Uh, he's also the maintainer so, of ggplot2 and the developer of, uh, of many like extensions such as uh, Patchwork, ggforce, and gganimate. And it's, uh, in his free time, so uh, he makes generative art created with R using the same tools as so he developers for DataVis. So I invite you, I highly invite you to to follow his uh, to follow him. Sorry on Twitter. Uh, yeah. So if you want like to uh, to have a look at our previous meetups, as uh, you have also been hosting uh, many other experts uh, in R. So um, the first one was about Gigi and. Uh, the second one about the R23 uh, package, and also uh, about the, the first one about the color picker and uh, uh, BS4 uh, packages. Uh, you are free like to have a look at this on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I will share with you uh, the link now uh, in the YouTube uh, box. Um, last thing, uh, if you have any uh, question or comment, just leave your message on the YouTube chat. Thank you all for joining us, and then I will let's start. Okay, okay. I will let Thomas start. Let me stop okay. sharing my screen. Okay, fine. It's coming. Yeah. Okay. Go. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen. And we should be good to go. Can you see my screen? Yes, now you should be able to do that. And I'll jump over here. So um, yeah, I, I'm here to talk about um, Tidygraph and ggref as well. And um, these are two packages that I've developed uh, to make it easier to work with network data. Um, so this is a talk with a bit of exercises in between, so you can kind of get yourself used to working with it um i'll just well you already heard about me so i'm not going to spend that much time on that um and then i'll try to kind of lay out the the whole idea about how are we going to like uh how do you look at networks how is it normal to look at networks and what what is it that i want to achieve with tidygraph and ggref and then i'm going to kind of go more into detail with the two different packages um and how they kind of work together um, before a wrap up. And you're free to ask questions at any time, but I will not see the questions. So um, Mona would will um, will relay them uh, to me, I think. But but questions at any time is, is uh, fully fine. Um, so yeah, as you already heard, my name is Thomas. I'm a former bioinformatician and data sci scientist, but I'm currently working as a software engineer in our studio where I 
I'm responsible for more or less everything graphics as it relates to data visualization and like the whole stack from from how you create PNG files up to maintaining ggplot2 and so on. And as you also heard, I'm mainly at this point in my uh, my career, I'm not really using my uh, my tools to create data visualizations because I'm not a data scientist anymore. Um, so I'm using them instead to create generative app. Um, yes, and I create a lot of packages. <laughs> Um, uh, a bit compulsory um, with that. It's, it's getting less and less. So a lot of these packages are actually rather old. But it takes a lot of time to to maintain so many packages. But a lot of them are um, extensions to ggplot2 or in another way related to how we create better graphics in R. So if you want to read up on me or follow me. I'm on Twitter and GitHub. And I also have this uh, Data Imaginist website where I sometimes blog um, about mainly when I have new packages to release. So let's get to the actual um, topic of today, which is network analysis. And when we talk about network analysis, we usually talk about it as um, as a contrast to the tabular workflow. When I think about the tabular workflow, you've probably seen this, um, this uh, visualization before. Um, this is something that we at our studio is, is pushing a lot, this idea of how do you go from having some raw data and getting some insight, which is like you import it, you do some um, transformation of the data, which we call tidying it up. And then we get, get into this cycle of, of transforming and visualizing and modeling, which will then inform you to do new transformation, new visualizations, new modeling. And you will iterate towards some understanding of this underlying data that you, in the end, communicate. And so this is, this is an approach that we at our studio believes in a lot. And, and it also informs how we kind of decide to develop packages and decide to develop features for these packages because this is what we want to work with. Now, I've, I've uh, headlined this with uh, the tabular workflow because this is what we usually use when our data is in more tabular form, like when we have data frames or something that is easily represented as a data frame. Now, the network workflow is often different. Um, you will usually see people importing it and then somehow converting it to a graph and then they will visualize it and then we'll just hope to get some insight that they can communicate now this is a of course a bit hyperbolic it's highly generalized but i think there's some some truth to this idea that, that network data is, is so different that it can be it can be quite difficult if you're not used to working with network data be quite difficult to to know what to really do so you visualize it and you hope that it kind of shows what you already expect it to show and then you can use it as a, an amazing figure in your um in your report or in your um in your communication so why is that well the the issue is that network data is fundamentally different from tabular data um, it's a completely different structure, um, and if you're not used to this structure, it can you you can feel like you have no idea where to attack it from. It's also, in some sense, very messy. Um, it is it is highly uh, multi-dimensional um, and and very very difficult to get a get a grip on. I've also like put it here again, kind of hyperbolic, but it's a bit of a problem that it can make some pretty and impressive looking plots because you can kind of convince yourself that you're done once you have this huge hairball showing thousands of nodes connecting with a lot of different edges and so on. And you can say, well, this is, this is surely quite impressive. I, I'm, I should be finished now. Like I'm, I made this plot that looks really, really complicated. Um, and so a lot of people can, can have a tendency to stop there instead of actually asking themselves, well, sure, it's an impressive looking plot, but does it actually answer any of my questions? Um, and lastly, it also has this 
um, very different semantics and it also has its, its very, very own algorithms uh, related to how you um, get information out of them. So you, a lot of the a lot of the knowledge that you have from working with tabular data does not really translate that well into uh, network data. There's also this in the bottom that Hadley don't really care about it. And I guess it's a bit tongue in cheek, but uh, Hadley has surely been a, a huge driver for how people uh, approach R. And like he has some blind spots and, and one of them is, is network data. He just doesn't care about it. And so it has gained or it ha has less, um, less focus in terms of, of making it easier to work with. Okay, so I kind of uh, came to this from the idea of um, wanting to do bioinformatics. We have a lot of networks in bioinformatics, and I was kind of annoyed with the with the lack of um, a coherent solution to this. So I set out uh, to create two packages. Um, it started with ggref, which is a ggplot2 extension package that concerns itself with network data. But I soon became aware that, well, we actually need something underlying it all, something that makes working with network data much more, uh, much more nice. Uh, and so I ended up creating tidygraph. And then I rewrote ggref more or less to be based upon tidygraph. So um, when we go back to this um, the schema for uh, for how we want to do the workflow, we can see that uh, we at R Studio and then Tidyverse have a spe specific packages attack attacking different parts of um, parts of the workflow that we usually would say like you import your data using Reader. We have Tidya mainly to do uh, tidying of the data, also dplyr to some extent. Um, and then we use dplyr to transform it, ggplot2 to visualize it. We have now tidy models, which is its own uh, huge ecosystem of, of ways to model data. And, and they kind of power this cycle of, of uh, iterative gaining of knowledge. And then communication is huge and sprawling area, ranging from R Markdown to Shiny and so on. And what I tried to achieve is that, well, I'm, I'm just one person, first of all, so I can't really create all the all the solutions for this but usually you still use reader to import it because um, even though network data is different it's usually represented by some some tabular data um, then we need to convert it to a graph and and tidygraph has a lot of functionality to do for doing this um, and then we should get into this this cycle again like poking at the at the network transforming it, looking at things like what might be interesting, visualizing it with ggref. We should perhaps also do some modeling. This is a step that I've, I don't know much about and I haven't tried to solve it. Um, there are different kinds of, of network-based uh, modeling tools, but I haven't been able to kind of uh, streamline them completely with tidygraph as of yet. Um, and then communication is, is more or less the same. So what I really wanted to achieve is, is more or less this feeling that, that uh, Hillary is, uh, was kind enough to tweet out that not knowing anything about networks and, and, and network visualization, picking up tidygraph, ggraph, feeling instantly at home if you're used to using dplyr and ggplot2. So you can go from knowing nothing to actually be able to to get something that you can get some insight out of in very short time, maybe not five minutes, but but at least like you you shouldn't be you shouldn't need to readjust yourself to working with networks as much if you rely on these tools. So tidygraph um, is a package that is um, trying to be an adaption and extension of the whole concept between dplyr, these verbs that you're using to, to modify your data, but instead of modifying um, uh, tabular data like data frames or tibbles, um, it's meant to work with network data. Um, it is also not just that, but it's also a certification uh, of 
almost all the algorithms that is provided in iGraph. And iGraph is, is a package in R that is um, one of the most powerful packages for um, making network analysis. And uh, the big issue is that it's not really that nice of an API to work with unless you have grown up with it, I think. So, so iGraph is hugely powerful and, and TidyGraph is, is taking all that power with it. Um, and it is taking it with it and, and providing a uniform API for all types of different relational data structure. And it's actually powered by iGraph underneath. So there is it's more or less no overhead in using TidyGraph compared to iGraph, but it provides a much, much nicer uh, layer of APIs for the user. Um, so underlying all of this is this idea of a data structure called the table graph. And if we take an, a network like we have here, we have, this is classic network where you have nodes, which are these entities. They can be anything, persons, accounts, whatever entities, and they're connected with each other with what we call edges. So, so there is a relation between these two entities. And this is basically the thing that makes um, network data different from uh, classic tabular data because the entities as such is, is more or less just standard tabular data, information about things. But on top of that, we also have connections between these entities and, and they, they mess up everything. Um, so we have nodes and we have edges and the nodes can have different categorical, can have different uh, numerical data attached to it called uh, node features. The same can, can be true for the edges as well. Like they can also have weights, they can also have different classes and so on. So what uh, one way that we can change this kind of messy data structure into something that we can easily understand if we come from uh, a data frame world is if we simply just uh, split them apart and, and create two um, tidy data frames or, or tibbles where we have each node is a row having features and each uh, edge is also a row. Now the edges is a bit different because apart from the features, they also have information of uh, regarding which two nodes they're connecting. Where does it go from and where does it go to? So these two columns will, will link this edge to two uh two rows over here but apart from that they are kind of just completely separate um data frames that we can work with right so nothing groundbreaking about that um so how do we create this table graph well the idea behind uh tidy graph is that it should be very very easy to go from one of those different uh network representations that you have in r, in r and just make it work with tidy graph. You don't need to do something um, something complicated to, to get going with tidy graph. So you can directly create them from, from already existing graph or network data structures, uh, like iGraph, network, uh, hclust, which is what you get, which you call um, make hierarchical clustering, dendrograms, graph, which is a package from a bioconductor, it's also supported Philo, data tree, and a lot of other uh, things. And you can also um, create table graphs from like kind of raw data that is not already in in graph form, but um, but is representing something like a graph. Um, so adjacency matrices is is basically just a matrix showing which. Um, which entities are, are close to each other. Adjacency list is just a list giving for each node, which node is it connected to and so on and so forth. Um, so all of this is, is quite simple. We have two, two functions, one called as table graph, which is kind of what you will mainly use to create a, a table graph because it, it simply just take input and, and understand it as graph and creates a table graph from it. Um, Table graph over here is, is kind of a direct um, direct constructor. So if you have the nodes table and the edges table, you can just create a graph from that. But usually you have it in some other sense, uh, some other way. 
So some exercises and I will, I know I haven't been showing a lot of code yet, so I will help you get going. But first and foremost, if you, if you have your, um, if you have an R session open, we're just going to use empty cars. It's a very, very simple little data set. And, and we will not learn anything new about empty cars. So um, we'll just use it for you to have some uh, some feeling of, of working with Tidygraph. Okay. So you have the, the exercises here. And the first is to create a distance matrix um, from the empty cast data set, which means that you should well, basically just call this. You don't need to think too much about whether it makes sense to create a distance matrix from empty cast. Just do it. Um, and then try to create a, a table graph from this distance matrix. And once you've done that, print it, look at it, just get a feel for for what the, um, what Tidygraph is is, uh, is telling you about this data set. Um, once I created these exercises, it uh, dawned on me that I have no support for dist objects, so which I should obviously. So you need to create, or uh, you need to to um, quest the dist objects into uh, a matrix first, just using S matrix before you're creating the tipple graph. Then um, you should also try to create a hierarchical clustering based on the dist object and convert that to a tipple graph and inspect it. Okay, does that make sense to people? We'll see. Um, and the idea is that, that I'll, I'll give you some time for this, like maybe five minutes and then I'll actually, uh, okay. then I'll actually solve the, the exercises afterwards. So you can see what I will, I'll be doing. So don't, if you don't have time for it, you can just go get as far as you, as you want. And then you can just pick up whatever I did. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. So you have a question from Paul. Is the code somewhere so that you can put uh, cut and paste? Um, well, the, the idea is that you write the code, of course. So, but if, if just to get you started, I can also just uh, begin to, to solve these things um, with you. Also, uh, uh, keep the side up. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Obviously. Um, yeah, I'm... This uh, doing workshop online is also new to me, mm -hmm. so so bear with me. <laughs> um, are you uh, okay? Uh, I can't. Someone is sharing. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we we have it now. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I'm uh, I'm adjusting to this as well. <laughs>
Okay, I think I will um, I'll start to just uh, solve them myself as well. Um, you should know that I wrote down these uh, exercises without actually solving them myself. So you might be able to see me doing all sorts of, of stupid things. Um, um, but I, I think that's actually quite healthy that you can see that um, even those creating the packages can get confused sometimes. So let's see. We'll start by opening up Tidygraph. And if we look at the empty cast data set, we can see it's it's all numerical data, which means that we can just directly create a dist uh, object using the dist function. So doing that, we'll see we have this um, huge matrix of the distance from from each row to its uh, to all the other rows based on Euclidean distance of, of uh, these different uh, values, which is of course not meaningful in, in any way because all of these values exist in different scales and ranges and so on, but we'll just ignore that for now. So as I said, if I try to use this as table graph, it should work, but I forgot to add support for it. So uh, it says no support for dist objects, but However, there is support for just having uh, a matrix input. And if you if you have a matrix with the same number of rows and columns, uh, Tidygraph will understand that as uh, as a, well, not maybe a, a distance matrix, but an, an incidence matrix that, that shows the connections between um, different nodes. So if we do that, we can see we get something out. A table graph containing 32 nodes, which is good. There were 32 cars in our data set. And we have 90, uh, 992 edges. It also gives us a, a slight overview of, um, of the graph. It's a directed symbol graph with one component, um, meaning a symbol graph means that there is only one edge between uh, two node pairs. And one component means that everything is connected to each other. There are no like separate islands. Then we can see the node data. We have 32 nodes, as I said. And the only thing that's there is actually the name, which was picked up by the, the names in the, uh, in the matrix. And then we have the edge data. We can see we have the from column and the to column, which will always be there. And then we have a weight column, which is actually the, the numbers it picked up from the matrix. Um, so it, it puts a lot of information in there by itself. Like it, it, it grabs the names, it grabs the numerical weights and so on. Um, and let's just save that as, let's see, dist graph. Just, we might, we might need it for the other exercises. <laughs> then the, the last question was that, um, try to create a hierarchical clustering of, uh, of this distance matrix and we can do that by simply using the h cluster function if we do that we'll get a hierarchical clustering object um, with different methods and so on and that uh, that object type is, is supported directly so you can just put that into uh, a table graph and we can see we'll get something now out of it again um, and you can see that there are different informations available here, which is should be kind of obvious because it's two different um, different types of graph. We can see we have we have many more nodes, like we have we have nodes for things that are not cast, but that's because a hierarchical clustering is kind of a tree. So every um, the casts are only the leaves of the tree, and every branch point is also a node, but it's not a car. So you have a lot of new um new nodes and you have a lot fewer edges um and you also have some new information here like uh, first and foremost we have um it can see that it's a tree it's a rooted tree it means it has a start end um we also know that that some of the nodes are leaves and some of them are not and the leaves have labels um and we also know how many members are part of um uh like the subtree that, that this node defines how many members did that have. 
Uh, on the other hand, we don't really have any edge data, right? So we can see that um, just by just by looking at the the print output from from uh, tidygraph, we can also already get some information about um, about our nodes and and the graph. Okay, edge class graph. I'll just save that. Okay, so that's that. Now, usually we'll not be working with sorry, such sorry. simple and, data. Sorry, sorry for interrupting you. No uh, yeah, you have a question from Amel. So uh, she didn't understand well what exactly the this function does. Is it something uh, like a correlation? Uh, yeah, so so the dist function is uh, is just something from from base R, which um, which takes uh, a data frame or a matrix and then calculates the distance from each row to all the other rows. So and it, it does that either using Euclidean distance based on the um, that's just so so it will it will calculate in in a multi-dimensional space with an MPG axis and our dimension and cylinder dimension and so on, it will calculate the Euclidean distance between this row and this row and this row and this row and this one so so forth. So you get the distance between each and every um, row in here. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, I think. Yes, normally. <laughs> so she will answer in the chat. Uh, another question from uh, Odili. What about centering and scaling? So, so usually, like like this is this is just to get some graph data to, to play with. This, um, if if you really wanted to to do something meaningful with the empty cast data set, yes, centering and and uh, normalization would be very very important before uh, calling this on this this was just to kind of have something quick where you, for you to just create a simple uh, table graph yes it's okay you are done thank you okay so um usually the world is is much more complex than uh, the empty cast data set so um just to show you what you can do at a larger scale, I uh, I have um, amassed a lot of information from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, I did this back in 2018, I think, uh, just to create an like a different kind of, of data set where you can uh, create some interesting uh, networks from. I don't think too much has happened in the in the cinematic universe since 2018, right? So. It should be pretty pretty up to date. Anyway, so um, this is just the data set. You don't you don't get to play with it. I, I'll just use it to uh, to make some some examples of what you can do with network data. Um, if you really want to play with it, I can provide it to you afterwards. Um, just ask uh, Mona, and I can uh, I can share it, and you can get it. Okay. So just for you to get some some sense about this data set. Um, it's a data set of uh, all the characters in this Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it has a lot of information about um, which type of, of character is it. Is it a hero? Is it a villain? Is it both? Is it, is it something else? Um, it gives an ID, which is, oh, sorry. It gives an ID, which is like a unique identifier for it. it also gives it the real name, aliases, whether it's human or scallion or whatever. Um, like a lot of information. And some of this information can actually be used to create uh, a network. Um, for instance, there is an affiliation, which is like, um, are you part of the Avengers? Are you part of whatever? This information can be used to kind of uh, make connections between everyone that is part of the same affiliation, right? We also have something like allies and enemies, uh, which is kind of direct uh links so so uh, misty knight has an ally called Raphael scarf that creates a link between these two right and the same with enemies so there's a lot of information in this pretty huge data set that we can use to to create networks from um if we just 
take out some of these uh, these columns. Um, appearance, affiliation, allies, enemies, and families. We can see that that they are all lists of information. Like appearance is a list column containing all the different um, movies they were in. Affiliation is a is a list column containing all the different things they are associated with. Allies is a list giving all the allies that this person has, and enemies is well enemies and families, family. So, what can we do with this kind of information? Well, um, if we look at the appearance, we can see that um, the first column or the first row, which was Misty Knight, had an appearance in the Luke Cage series, in the Iron Fist series, and the Defenders. Um, and if you take the second one, which is Spider Man, he appeared in a lot of movies and so on. And we can use that information to to create connections between um, characters that appeared in the same uh, TV shows and movies, right? So one way we can do this, because this is not served to us in the same easy digestible way as a distance matrix or an h plus object. So we'll need to do some work for it to be more um, network-like. Um, but once we, we, we've done this work, uh, Tidygraph will take over and make sure that it actually end up being a network. So this might look a bit weird, but it's um, I'll walk you through the code. So we'll take this huge data set of characters and then we'll um, transmute it. We'll take we'll create an appearance um, column, which is based on the, the current appearance column. And in this appearance, uh, from this appearance column, we'll take all the appearances and we'll create a, a table inside um, inside this um, inside this mapping function we'll create a table that contains all of the um, all of the the things they they were in like all the movies and series and, and TV shows they were in and there will just be a one there so we'll get um we'll just get a table where you have like um iron man iron man 2 uh, thor the avengers and there will just be a one in them so we'll get a, a new appearance column which is a list of tables and then we'll unnest it because that means that all of these tables will get upended together um so we'll end up with um, a data frame where you have as rows you have all the characters and as columns, you have all of the, the different things that they could appear in. And if they appeared in it, it has a one. If it didn't appear in it, it has an NA because um, because that's what uh, bind rows will, will put in. And then we'll just mutate all and say, well, if it's an NA, you just put a zero in it. So in the end, we have a data frame containing characters in um, as rows and movies uh tv series as columns and then either a one or a zero um denoting whether they uh, this person or this character appeared in it or not and that information is enough for tidygraph to just say well now i know you have an uh have an edge or uh, a graph structure i'll convert it to a graph for you um and we'll just call oh, um a typical graph yeah. from it we have someone who's asking, uh, do you have a link to this data set? Yeah, I didn't want to share it because I didn't want you to spend too much time looking at it because it's rather complicated. But um, just a second. Let's see if I can share it with you. Uh, I'll just stop sharing. And I do wonder. I am 
Sorry, I do not have now, or it will take too much time to share it, but I will make sure that you, you get it afterwards and, and okay. together with the slides. Um, yeah, so sorry okay. for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're... Can you, I'm trying to share my screen again. I think you need yes. to allow me to. Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Yeah, there fine. We go. Okay. So, in the end, we we get a we get a network structure out of it, and it has a huge amount of edges, right? And it has a node for all the different characters in our data set. Um, you can also see that it's an undirected multigraph. It has sixty one different com components, like uh, different kind of cliques of characters that only appear together with each other and have no like cross pollination between each other. Um, so that is one way to create like a more uh, complex graph where you use some of the, the normal um, normal skills that you have from, from tabular data to transform some tabular data into something that can be considered uh, encoding a graph. And then you'll just allow Tidygraph to take that information and, and convert it. Um, another, maybe a bit easier to understand um, example is if you just have the allies column um, from our character set, we can see that um, the first one, uh, Misty, uh, what was the name? Misty Knight um, has a lot of allies um, in here, Daredevil, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, and so on. So we'll, we want to create a, a network that has uh, connections between um, all of the allies, right? But in itself, like this, this data structure in itself is actually directly encoding a graph. So um, you don't have to do that much to, to convert it to a table graph. You'll just take the allies column and then you'll just add names to, to this list because you want the names to be, be the same as like the, uh, the, the names that we're using inside of each uh, list element. So the the Daredevil list element should be called Daredevil, right? So we we set the names and then we can just directly convert it to table graph. Um, and, and we can see that we, we have a directed multigraph again with a lot of components. Because, so apparently we can already see here that we have again a lot of, of different cliques of, uh, of people that are allies with each other and they don't have that much cross pollination, right? Um, and we can, we can do this for all the different uh, columns that we talked about. Um, so, so here I just made um, a graph based on an affinity or uh, based on, on uh, like, are they part of Avengers, are they part of whatever? Um, based on the appearance, like which movie or TV show they were in, a graph based on who's allies with who, a graph based on who's enemy with who, and a graph based on who's family and family with who. And inside these graph, I've just um, made sure to um, to add to the to the edge information, which type of edge is it? Is it a family edge? Is it an enemy edge? Is it an ally edge? Or is it an appearance edge? And so on. And um, Tidygraph then also makes it quite easy to say, well, I have all these different graph structures, but they're all concerning the same, like they're all characters from, from the Marvel universe. Um, so I actually want to create like a huge, uh, graph or network based on, on all of this information. And, and usually with tabular data, you would use some kind of join to, to combine all this information. And I've added something called a graph join in, uh, in Tidygraph, where it will join the nodes based on a, on a full join and all of the edges will just kind of fall into place. So if you have different, um, different data uh, or network data with concerning the same type of nodes or the same actual same nodes, you can very, very easily combine it to one master graph by just using graph join. Um, graph join like left join or right join or whatever takes two um, 
two data sets and join them together. But you can join multiples together by just reducing it uh, using the re reduce function. If you're not familiar with the reduce function, it's it's something in, in base R where you just consecutively call the same function on on the result of the um, of of the function call and the next thing in in your vector. So it will first call graph join with this. And then we'll call graph join with this and the result of this graph join. And then we'll call graph join with this and the result of the new graph join and so on. In the end, you get a huge graph with um, the same number of nodes, but now with uh, 25,000 uh, edges. And it's highly connected now. Uh, those, there are six components. And you have a lot of, uh, well, Actually, not that much information now. You just have the information about what type of, of edge is, is there. But usually, when you've created all of these graphs, you kind of lose a lot of information about the nodes. Like you don't, you only have the node ID down here, and you have so much information about the nodes that you actually want to um, attach to the graph because you want to use it when you do visualization and so on. So. What you could do now with this full graph that we have, the marble graph, um, we can begin to, to work with it in the same way that you would work it with it with dplyr, uh, using mutate and, and all the different uh, uh, verbs that, you, that you're used to. The only thing that is, is kind of new here is this activate verb. And this activate verb tells tidygraph what what part of the the graph are you actually working with right now? Are you working on the edges or are you working on the nodes? So if I activate the edges and call mutate, this mutate will be be created in the context of the nodes. So you create, uh, you change the weight column to uh, say, well, if weight is um, is NA, it will just get a one. So kind of what you would use normally in mutate but here you just well i have a graph and it contains edges and, and nodes and now i'm working with edges and now i'm going back to working with nodes and i'll do a left join of the original data into the nodes which means that we'll end up with all of the different data joined together um and, and we'll have this readily available for us uh, working further on okay this was uh, a deep dive into um, what you can do with tidygraph, um, what you can do when transforming data and so on, will not get that far. As I said, I will share the the data set, and you can you can follow the the code back at home to to get more information out of it. Um, so let's see. We are actually already. I'm already speaking too much. I think. Um, and you can uh, just stop sharing. I think I will just read up the, the exercises because I have a lot to talk about. Uh, and I will, I will do the exercises with you. Um, you, can, you can kind of ignore what I'm saying and just do your own thing, but I will just do the exercises myself as well. So you can either just follow along or you can just ignore what I'm saying just so we don't have um, too much time where we're just have nothing going on. Is that okay with you? Yes, it's okay for me. <laughs> yes. For for people who are following us, just confirm this in the chat. It's okay. Okay. Cool. So I will just I'll read up the exercises and then I'll I'll go right on to solving them. And you can see I'll probably make some errors along the way and you can learn from that as well. Um and you need to allow me to share the screen again. Yes, so it's coming. No okay. okay, there we go. So, um, so we want to, to try our hands with uh, transforming the data. And the first one is that we, we had these two graphs. Well, let's see if we can combine them into one graph because both graphs are encoding the same data set just in different ways. So they have sort of the same nodes already. Um, so we need to, to combine them together so the, the same nodes are, are merged together. And then we should try to add back the information from empty cars to, to the nodes. 
And then the last thing is like, what is the difference between graph join and bind graph, which are two functions in tidy graph. And I can, I'll uh, just talk about that when we get there. So we have, um, we have our two graphs, the disk graph and the H cluster graph, right? And we can see that um, the, the disk graph has a name column, which is, is here. And the, the H plus graph has a label column, which is kind of what we want to merge by. So when you're usually doing a left join or whatever, you can either just ask left join to figure out if there's any, any columns with the same names and use that, or you can tell it directly. You want to use this column from this data set with this column from this data set. Now you can see that um, the label column also has new nodes. Like there are, as we talked about, there are branch points that are not present in this graph, but it, uh, it's not a problem at all. It will just, uh, the graph gem will just only join the things together that, that looks alike, right? So one way to do this is graph join. Oops, sorry. And we'll take the disk graph and we'll take the edge cluster graph. And then we'll just specify by as being um, the first one was by name. And the name should be equal to label. Right. Let's see. It actually does what it wanted to do. So um, we end up with a, a new graph. We'll just call it full graph like that. We'll end up with a new graph that has this, the information from both the distance matrix graph and the hierarchical clustering graph all combined into one, which is pretty neat. Um, and then just say, and we want to add back the information from empty cards to the nodes. So we need to have a look at nodes. We have this name column still. And if we look at empty cards, well, it actually doesn't have any name column. So it doesn't, it, it encodes the data as, as row names. So if we just say empty cars, um, mutate empty cars, and we'll just give it a new column that is name. It's called name, and we'll take the row names from empty cars. Oops, sorry. So now we will add it a new column and we can, that means that if we do um, a left join with the notes data, then it will be automatically merged. So if we just save this, cars new, and we have our full graph over here and we just want to do um, a left join. Now we want to do the left join on the node data, but we can see already that the node data is active. So we don't need to activate it first, but we could, we could do that just to, oh, sorry. What happened there? Um, we can just normally, just to be sure, you can say activate nodes and then we'll do a lift join with the empty cars new data set. Ah, sorry. <laughs> I told you that will be errors. We'll have the full graph. There we go. So now we can see that um, we still have a graph structure, but we have also added all the information from our empty cast data set back together again, right? Um, now, what's the difference between graph join and bind graphs? Now, these, these are two functions that, that feel superficially um, equal. I'll just save this uh, into the full graph. Right, okay. Um, the, the graph join, as we saw, would actually merge things together that are alike. It's a join. Um, 
bind graph is more like um, bind rows in the sense that it, it just takes two graph and combines them into uh, a single graph structure, but still with, with two, um, two separate graphs existing between each other, if that makes sense. So if you have, if we do bind graph with uh, the dist graph and the um, H cluster graph, we can see that we certainly have many more nodes than before. We have uh, 95 compared to 63 up here. And that's because there are no nodes that have been merged together. They, they, have, they have just been like put into the same network structure, but nothing has been merged. So there will just exist two separate graphs in this network structure, okay? Um, so just moving on, we have more things than just mutate and transmute and, and the things we saw here. Basically everything from dplyr uh, works when you're working with tidy graph. There are two exceptions, which is do and summarize. And the reason for that is that it doesn't really make sense to, to collapse um, information from multiple nodes or multiple edges as you would do in summarize, which takes a, a full data set and, and collapses it into one row. But everything else that kind of maintains this idea of a mapping between the nodes and, and the edges works. And as we've seen, I've also added uh, graph specific versions. Um, you can have bind nodes and edges and graphs. And there's also this concept of graph join. There's also um, completely new concepts that only make sense for uh, for graph. There's a concept called morphing of a graph and unmorphing. You can, it is not the same as group by and ungroup, um, but, but maybe it makes sense to, um, to think about it that way. Morphing is the idea of taking one graph structure and then temporarily changing it to another graph structure that makes more sense for you for solving a specific subtask and then you'll solve it in this um in this new temporary structure and then you unmorph and everything all the things you calculated and so on will be brought back to the original um data structure and i'll show you an example of of, of this in action later on um there's also the idea of, of crystallize which is is basically just taking morphing and making instead of making it temporary will actually make it uh, permanent. A convert is just a shortcut for uh, morph and crystallize. There's also this idea of rerouting, which is while you can do everything from dply in terms of using mutate and so on, the to and from columns in the edge table are sacred in the sense that you are not allowed to touch them. The only way you can touch these are through the reroute uh, function that actually allows you to move edges between nodes. Um, furthermore, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, network analysis is very much reliant on, on very specific algorithms that that looks as this the topo topology of networks. And there's a lot of these uh, algorithms, and um a lot of them are available in iGraph and so on but none of them are particularly tidy um so tidygraph has taken all of these algorithms and, and made them make sense in a in a mutate semantic um so you can use them inside mutate and get the information out of them and assign them to to columns as you would usually do working in like this deep plier ish uh way so we have a very smooth integration of uh, these graph algorithms um a nice thing is that all of these algorithms kind of know in which context they're called so you don't have to specify the graph and the nodes and so on like in the same sense as if you're using the end function in um, in, in dplyr to get the number of rows you don't have to pass in the data to end like it, it knows it knows the data when it's called right and it, it, it's the same with the, the tidy graph algorithms. And there's also a very consistent naming scheme. So it allows you to very easily get to the different, um, different types of, uh, of, 
of same algorithms. So just to give you a very, very quick overview, there's something called centrality algorithms that kind of tries to calculate how central a node or an edge is to the graph structure. And there's a lot of ways to do that. So centrality underscore whatever algorithm is used, for example, PageRank, which is what's the original Google ranking scheme. Um, you can also have like things like node and edge type. Is this node a leaf? Is this edge a loop? And so on. We can also calculate uh, meshes between pairs of nodes. So what is the distance from this node to this node or the similarity between them? We can also calculate something uh, uh, related to the, the local area around the node, um, different types of node meshes and so on. I'm not going to go get into this because it will, it will require a deep understanding of a lot of these things. But um, just to... Just to uh, just to show that all of these different uh, algorithms are available and are available in a very, very nice format for you to use. There's also the idea of, um, of doing a search in a graph, which is something that if you begin to work a lot with networks or graphs, you would probably end up doing a lot. Um, when I'm talking about a search, I mean going from one node and then just searching out into the graph and seeing when you hit something like following the edges, now you're at this node, now you're at this node, now you're at this node. And there are different uh, strategies for doing this search. Something is called, that's something called a breadth first search, where you just try to visit every node, every neighboring node before you begin to visit every neighboring node and every neighboring node and every neighboring node. There's also a depth first search, which is like, I'll just follow my neighbor and this neighbor and this neighbor and this neighbor until I can no longer follow, like until I reach an end and then I'll just backtrack and then follow this, this, and this, okay? So there's different ways to search a graph and there's a lot of different ways to do that in Tidygraph by getting statistics from the search or actually by doing a mapping over the search where you just, you, you create the search and every time you visit a node, you, you're allowed to call a function and you're allowed to know what was the result of the previous nodes as well. Um, so we are getting into kind of a per like, um, um, uh, how do you say, a per like approach to, uh, to network analysis as well. Um, so what I'm actually trying to build up to is the idea that you can have a graph and you can actually pretty easily um, make some hypothesis or ask a question about this uh, this network. So for instance, I might wonder who is Iron Man's closest enemy, meaning that who um, among Iron, all of Iron Man's enemies, who among him are closest connected to him as friends? Like does Iron Man have a friend who is friend with someone who is Iron Man's enemy and how like, how far out do you need to have, like, do you need to have a friend with a friend with a friend who is then an enemy of Iron Man? Like, which one is closest then? Like, that's that's a fair question to be interested in, if you're a Marvel fan, at least. Um, but like, that also mimics something that you might want to to investigate in a, in a network. And and one way to, to actually very, very directly um, use Tidygraph to answer this is if we, if we have this huge graph, then we can say, well, I'm going to activate the edges. And then I'm going to say, well, just for the time being, I want to only work on a network that, that only have edges that are allies. And I'm using this morph, um, morph verb that we talked about. I'm saying I'm morphing it to a subgraph where it only contains edges where class equals ally. So it's kind of a filtering, but it's a temporary filtering. It's not a, you're not throwing anything away. You're just entering a new, um, a new uh, form of this graph. And while we are at that graph, we're, we're activating the nodes and we're adding a new column called friend dist. And this friend dist is based on a breadth first search, starting from Iron Man and just visiting out. So it, it says, well, if I'm start, starting from Iron Man and just 
moving out. How how many times do I need to move out from Iron Man to to reach each node in the graph, and it creates a distance from that. So so now we have uh, a distance from Iron Man from for every node only based on the edges that are allies, right? Now we actually have our, the information that we want. So we unmorph our graph. We're getting back to the, to the full state of, uh, of our graph. But now we have this friend dist column still, even if we, if, even if we created it in the subgraph, we, uh, we still have it with us after unmorphing it. Now we're just filtering our graph. We're removing all of, um, um we're, we're removing all of the rows where um that are not enemies with iron man so we're filtering and saying well we need the id of of these rows to be in the enemies column uh, of iron man and then we arrange it by the distance so that sounded like a lot of a lot of steps to get there but but honestly it's 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 very very um it's actually quite simple, and it's it's um, it's quite easy to to formulate these questions as code once you get used to it. And what do we what do we get? Well, maybe it's no surprise. Uh, we have a couple of um, of characters that are pretty close, that are enemies to Iron Man, but are pretty close in terms of of ally connection. So the Winter Soldier is maybe, as you know, a friend with uh, Captain America, who is friend with uh, Iron Man, but the Winter Soldier and Iron Man are enemies. Loki is kind of the same, like he's friendly with Thor, and Thor is friend with uh, with Iron Man. So it all makes sense, um, and and it was all formulated with this same type of dplyr semantic that we're all uh, familiar with, but with a few things that are specific to graphs. Um, another question we might want to ask is like, this is a huge franch uh, franchise, um, and it kind of contains different um, different parts of um, like that. There might be small groups of movies that are linked together, and within these groups are there are there certain characters that are that are more um, that are more present than others um so so who are these who are these central characters to the different uh the different sub universes in the marvel cinematic universe um and we can do that by saying well we have the full graph again we'll activate the the edges and we'll just remove all the edges that are not based on appearance which because right now we're just interested in appearances and then we convert um convert this graph to components, which means that we'll actually will split up the graph to sub uh, to, to to separate graphs of um, of unconnected components. So what we'll what we're doing is that we're saying um, a component in a graph sense is a small subgraph that is not connected to anything else. So based on this appearance graph, we'll just split it up into smaller subgraphs and continue to work with them as a single graph, but it's just split it out. Um, and we'll, we'll morph them again into, um, into a split graph based on a, a grouping. Oh, this is getting, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll convert it, then we'll um, activate the nodes and we'll morph it to, um, to a different set of smaller subgraph based on uh, on a, a grouping algorithm, which means that well, it it, it basically calculates clustering of nodes, and we use this clustering to split it up. And when within that grouping, we'll uh, we'll calculate how many neighbors um, all of the the different um, characters has. If it's highly connected, it's central. If it's uh, less connected, it's it's less central, right? And and then we'll just keep only those uh, nodes that has the highest degree, like that has the highest centrality. Then we'll 
just pull out the graph and then pull out the characters. And we can see that we have um, we have a, a set of, of different cliques that we get out of it. And one of the cliques are composed of Hulk, Nick Fury, Iron Man. These are characters that are part of a lot of the different uh, movies in the main storyline with Avengers and Iron Man movies and so on. Um, we have a clique of Claire Temple, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, that, that looks kind of like the Netflix uh, Defender series. And these were the these were the characters that were mo most present there and so on. Down here we have like the the part that's related to um, to Guardians of the Galaxy and these are the people that always are there. So it was a bit clumsy the explanation here, but but hopefully you can see that you can formulate questions that you want to take out of the out of the network. And using Tidygraph and Dply, you can actually um, begin to answer these questions without even having to to do any visualization at all. You just like kind of ask questions from the network structure. Um, I think. Yeah. We, so, uh, sorry for interrupting you. You yes. have a question from Av. So he's asking, could you? Can I activate node and then morph function or sequence here is uh, crucial? Is important. Uh, can you just say that again? Sorry. So, uh, can I activate node and mm -hmm. then uh, morph? This is the function mm -hmm. or sequence here is important. Um, some of the morphs um, can work on either node or edges, in which case it's important. So it's kind of you, you have to know the different morph types. Um, so for instance if we go back here and we say morph to subgraph only those that are ally here it's it's very important that i activate edges before because you can also make a subgraph where only node uh nodes of class ally exist so whether nodes or edges is activated here is important in terms of what comes out of it right um but it's not true for all of the morphs um, because some of the morphs are kind of agnostic to whether edges or nodes are, are present or not. Um, for instance, if uh, in, the, in the split morph where you just split up the graph, um, it also makes sense to, to either activate nodes or edges because you can either split edges out or you can split nodes out. If that makes sense. Um, so sometimes it matters, sometimes it don't. It's it's always, um, I would say it's it's always a good idea to be verbose in your code when you write this down. So if you want to work on nodes, even though you know that nodes are already um, are already uh, activated, or even though you know it doesn't really matter. I think it's a good practice to to be verbose and actually write it out because it allows someone else to to read your code and say, well, okay, I I follow you. I know you're working on notes right now, so so it's a good habit to get into. Yeah, thank you. More questions? Uh, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. Um. Okay, so um, here are some, some exercises to get you going with the algorithms. Um, I will solve them pretty fast because I'm taking too much time, <laughs> sorry. Um, so calculate the page rank measure weighted by reciprocal weight and add it to the node features. Um, that is, um, if we just get over here and we'll just, work on the disk graph for now. So we have a weight. Uh, no, sorry. Sorry. Yes, I was just confusing myself. So if we have the, the disk graph here, we can use um, 
uh, we can try to, to calculate different centrality measures. And usually you would, you would add them to the nodes. So we can say mutate centrality um, equals centrality. And then you can see there's a lot of different ways to calculate centrality, like a lot. And, and they are all different and they all give you different answers. And, and that might seem annoying, but there's a lot of different ways to perceive centrality in, in networks. There's rarely just a single right answer, which is why there are so many centrality measures. But here we'll just use the page rank and then we'll use the edge weight. So it makes sense that if a node is, is connected to a lot of other nodes, but with very, very weak connections, then it shouldn't be as central as a node with a lot of strong connections, right? So we're going to use the weight uh, measure. But if we remember back, the weight measures comes from distances. So the farther things are away from each other, the higher the weight right now, which is, is not what we want. Like if, if something is farther away from each other, they should have a low weight. So we'll just take the reciprocal value of it. Um, wait, there we go. And just like that, we, we get it. So we'll get a new centrality score. Um, centrality scores are dimensionless. You can just, you can only use them to compare to the other centrality scores for, uh, for the other nodes. They, they do not make sense in, in a, in an absolute way, but we have it here, right? um we just talked about why we're using reciprocal weight it's because we want the weight um to be low for things that are farther away from each other okay which car is the most and least central in the graph well let's see um if we mutate centrality then we can filter and saying centrality equals max Centrality, right? Yes, and we'll get that the master RX wag is the most central for some reason. <laughs> um, we can do the same with um, the minimum, and we'll see that Maserati is is maybe the the oddest car of them all if we if we want to to think about centrality in that way um there's also a question here calculate a grouping of the cars based on the walk trap algorithm using again the reciprocal weights so there is again kind of with the same thing as with centrality there's a lot of ways to do clustering of networks in the same way there's a lot of ways to do clustering of tabular data and clustering in a network context is often called grouping or it's called um uh cluster analysis or uh, community detection because a lot of uh, network analysis comes from analyzing people and and so some of the names um, make sense in that context the so community detection is, is obviously something that's related to finding communities between people but it's all the same it's all just clustering of, of nodes so again if we take the disk graph and we will mutate it again usually we'll just add new information to it and here we'll use group walk trap and again using the reciprocal weights for the grouping <coughs> <coughs> sorry we can see we get a new column called group and if we if we just pull that out we can see that it's just a, a vector of indices and it, um, it just says that everything with a one is grouped together, everything with a two is grouped together, everything with a three is grouped together. Um, so what, what does this mean? Um, investigate the nature of the grouping. I will not, um, I'll leave that as a challenge for you for later, but just, it is, it is of course related to the different types of cars um, because the distance comes from the different numerical values of the data set right um let's get on 
with um, so so this was just wrapping up what Tidygraph can do without even touching upon visualization. And one of the reasons that I've spent so much time talking about that is that there's a lot of danger in beginning to visualize networks um, simply because it, it begins to bias how you understand the network um, because network visualization is imperfect and there's a lot of um, hidden choices by algorithms that decide how it ends up looking. And you might end up becoming too confident in these arbitrary choice, choices in, in a way that makes you um, becoming informed by them. It is much better to approach a network unbiased and, and simply see if you can begin to, to pry out information without even visualizing it. So why even visualize it? Well, visualization is perfect in network which, uh, networks for communicating findings. It is less perfect um, when it comes to um, informing yourself. It can be used, but it should be used with care. Right. So when you need to make visualizations, I've created a package called ggref. <coughs> and it's a complete adaption of relational data to ggplot2, meaning that it's not just hairballs and node link diagrams. It's it's It should be um, in the same way as ggplot2 uh, can be used to create more or less any type of visualization of um, tabular data. It is not just a framework for doing um, bar charts or um, scatter plots. They can be used for anything. Um, GGRF aims to be exactly the same for network visualization. There's a lot of different ways to visualize networks. And the idea of GGRF too is to provide a completely coherent API for all of them, meaning that it's also very, very easy to, to change uh, things while you're visualizing it. It has um, a concept called layouts. And layouts is really just some algorithm that take in the network data and calculate an X and Y position for each node. And the reason why this is, uh, is so important in network visualization is that they're highly multidimensional and, and you usually do not um, plot them in an X and Y uh, manner in the same way as you would plot uh, tabular data. You don't put some variable on the X axis and variable on the Y axis you will use a layout to figure out um, a 2D um, representation of the nodes that, that best capture the topology of the network. But as I talked about, these are highly, highly complex algorithms that, that figure out these things. And there is no 2D representation of a network that is actually true to the network. So you'll always just get like, uh, a part of it, and which is why you should be so careful about using network visualization to draw conclusions from. Okay, it contains dedicated geoms for both nodes and edges. Uh, it contains new facetings, new guides, and all of all of the things that is needed for actually visualizing networks. And when we look at uh, a ggraph call, it will look a lot like a ggplot2 call um, in some ways and in some ways not. So we start at the top. Usually you would start a ggplot2 uh, plot by calling ggplot and putting in the data, maybe doing some mapping up here. <clears throat> With ggref, you use the ggref call instead and you add the data, the graph that you want to, to visualize, and then you specify a layout. And the layout is specified up here because it will be central to everything that comes after it because it defines how the different nodes is placed. Um, and here I'm just using a layout called Hochmann Rheingold, which is classic. Don't need to know about it. It's just it's a classic algorithm for spreading out nodes, right? Um, so this is kind of instead of the ggplot call, and then we begin to add stuff to. We'll be start by adding some geoms. We'll add geom edge link, which is just drawing a straight line between nodes that are connected. 
I'm just setting a, a low opacity here because there's a lot of lot of edges. And we'll add uh, the nodes as well, geom node point, um, which just draws a point, like kind of the same as geom point. But as you can see, there are separate um, there are separate uh, geoms for edges and nodes. And it's actually so that geom edge geoms will know to only use the data related to edges and geom node uh, geoms will use the data related to nodes. You don't have to think about um, selecting the right kind of data to plot. It just happens automatically. It also means that when you do mapping, for instance, in geom node, the mapping happens, of course, to node data. So you don't need to worry about whether your edge data has um, uh, a column called type, for instance. Um, there's other ggref features. For instance, you can have a faceting, as you know from from uh, ggplot2, but you can't really use ggplot2 faceting um, because it contains two very different data, the edges and the nodes. So instead, ggref provides its own faceting. For instance, you can facet nodes. Here we're faceting the nodes by um, uh, a community detection algorithm. And this is kind of interesting because you can see I can actually call this community detection algorithm inside facet nodes, which means that somehow this this uh, this grouping algorithm knows which graph it is being called in the context of. But it all just happens automatically and kind of magically. So this is pretty nice that you can actually you don't have to pre-calculate a lot of things when working with ggref2 you can just call the the algorithms from from tidygraph directly within uh, the calls so maybe you want to facet first by uh, one grouping algorithm then you want to facet by another grouping algorithm and it's it's very very easy to just switch out the different algorithms and see the the effect of it um we can add a specific theming um partly because uh, as I talked about, the X and Y axis are meaningless in most um, data or network visualization. So you don't want to have them. You just want to have it laid out bare. And one last important point is that all the standard ggplot2 features works as well. So ggref is just uh, a ggplot2 extension. It is still creating ggplot2 objects, which means that you can use all the classic ggplot2 things that you will usually use as well. So even though it has some different semantics for some of the things, it's all just ggplot2 underneath. And you can use theming, labs, whatever from ggplot2 as well. Um, it's also data agnostic. Um, here, up here, we just we passed in a table graph, which it works nicely with. But for instance, if we have an H cluster object, um we're just making a clustering of um of our marvel graph so we have a hierarchical clustering if you put that into ggref and say draw a dendrogram well it actually just works and the reason why it just works is that it under the hood it converts everything to a table graph and table graph table graph knows how to understand h cluster objects so more or less all the different data types that you can think of as as networks you can just pop right into ggref and and have it work um as it should so um just to show you some very very basic plotting um i will start by oops, just increasing this for the absolute easiest way of plotting st things with ggref Let's just load it up. Um, there is a function called autograph, which is kind of like autoplot in, in ggplot2, um, but it does something more. So it will actually, if we have our dist graph here, if we use uh, autograph on that, we can see that, well, this is, this is pointless and meaningless, but it's there. Um, uh, it, it creates a node edge diagram as uh, we may be familiar with. However, if we take the H class graph instead, which is a tree, we can see that it actually creates a diagram. 
uh, or a, a dendrogram plot. And, and it's able to do that by doing some introspection into the graph and figuring out, well, this is a tree. So the user is probably more interested in, in creating a dendrogram more than it's interested in, in creating a, a node edge diagram. So it's, it's pretty easy to get going with, with autograph to just put something on the screen. Um, now I have read through the documentation of autograph um, and use that to add labels and colors based on the data. Um, so we can, let's see. Graph. Let's see, we have some labels already here. So if we, if we take this, uh, this graph, or this plot, there's there's some easy way to just get going and say, well, I want um, label to come from the label column. Oh, no label, probably, I think. There we go. So so it will need some more margin, but but anyway, it will um, it will try to be clever about uh, adding nodes and maybe we can also no that's it so so there's uh there's some way to very very easily get going with uh, with gg uh ggref kind of the same idea that that you had with qplot and uh in ggplot2 it's a uh, quick and dirty plotting um it actually removes a lot of the things that makes ggplot2 or ggref uh, very useful but on the other hand, you, you're very, very quick to put something on the screen. So if I wanted to make this dendrogram um, without using autograph, I would start with a ggref call and put in my hclust graph. There we go. And then I need to specify that I want to create a dendrogram. So layout should be dendrogram. And then I need to, if I just do this, I'll, I'll get nothing because I haven't, I haven't created or I haven't uh, specified any way to draw the edges and nodes or whatever. So what happens if I just do geom edge link? We saw that before. Oh, we get this. So we can actually see that it's a tree, but it's not like the view that we wanted to have. So it's probably the wrong edge type. Let's try um, another edge type. Now, I'm cheating because I know all the edge types, but let's try this. Well, that's that looks kind of interesting. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it's it's kind of pleasing to look at. So the, the one I'm, I'm going for is the geom edge elbow, which is the one that has like a, a sharp bend. And we get get this look, but it's, it's still not quite right. Like we can see the there's something funky going on with the heights. And this is actually because the layout algorithm does not know anything about the height of the nodes that we have up here. Um, but we can we can inform it of that. Height equals height. And we're back to the to the view that we saw before. So you can see autograph does a lot of introspection of the data to figure out, well, this is actually what you usually would want to do. Um, but you can get there by just doing regular ggref calls and it was it's probably best to to quickly dive into doing like direct ggref calls with ge adding geoms and so on because you would be much more quicker to pick it up um just to show i'm not going to go through all of those um but just to show that there is a lot of different ways of visualizing networks um if we let's see we'll just reduce the graph a bit um to only contain edges that are allies or enemies and remove nodes that are no longer connected with it and then here i'll just create a lot of different um graphs based on different types of layouts and i will just add them all together with uh, with patchwork and we can see that these are all the same types of uh, network visualization, something called 
node edge diagrams. And the only thing that is different is the different layout algorithms. And they do not agree on how the network should look. I, I think we can all agree on that. And this just further goes to reinforce that the choices you make in terms of selecting the layout algorithm is hugely influential in terms of what kind of visual output you get. And if you rely too much on the exact placement of nodes, you will rely a lot on the actual layout algorithm <clears throat> in a way that it's never been designed to do. So please, 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 if you begin to visualize network, test out different uh, layout algorithm and try to shield yourself from the idea that this layout algorithm um, gives you the final truth. It gives you a part of the truth or it gives you a version of the truth, right? Um, I will jump over this. I hope it's okay because we are only have a half an hour left and I, I would like to get to the, to the end of this, right? Is there any questions? uh yeah so you have a question from wd sorry if it was already mentioned but was there some hints comments on um performance limits uh means to join match memory uh with a graph i think he forgets to mention a word uh a graph etap and what um dimensions uh i think um, i mm, sorry i'm i'll just Jumbo. can you share the, yeah, this a long is question? In the comment uh, in the comment section you see just on the right side um, mm, over here or in the here yeah you were on stream yard right the platform i mean you want to see the question right yes yeah this is right so just have a look at uh, the right side please you have comments yeah ah, fine. Oh, sorry. yes yeah yeah there it's okay go. Um, ah, yeah, so, well, that's a, that's a very good question and very important question. Um, so networks can be notoriously, uh, tough in terms of, um, in terms of how much memory they take up and how much CPU they take up. And and huge networks, um, well, just the scaling is is never linear, um, or almost never linear. And some of these layout algorithms are like they they will they will make your computer explode if you put in uh, like too huge uh, a network. So I wouldn't say that I have any direct hints. But there are network layout algorithms that have been designed to be used on huge networks. Um, for instance, um, this one down here, large graph layout, um, is is designed to work with huge graph. It's it's doing a horrible job right now, but it also it's a layout algorithm that, that requires a lot of, of fine tuning. So that's probably why it looks so so horrible. Um, and there's also a package called graph layout, um, which is actually what is being used by default. If you just if you don't specify a layout, it will use a stress reduction um, layout algorithm from the graph layout uh, package. And that package also contains um, some some layouts optimized for like huge, huge um, graphs. But it is it is certainly something that you have to be mindful of. Um, GGRAF itself cannot do that much about it because it, it's outsourcing a lot of the network or the layout calculation to, for instance, iGraph. Um, so it has no idea how well iGraph will do with it. So it's best to just often um, try out with a, if you know you have a, a huge graph, try out with a with a small subset of the graph and see if it works and then you can kind of scale up scale up okay um is that uh oops yes yes let's see uh, yeah 
I will jump over this. Um, it is mainly just for you to, uh, to to play around with a symbol graph and, and see the, the result of the different layouts. Uh, <coughs> I, will, I will comment on this one down here because it's an important point. Which layout provides the correct view of the graph? And I hope by now you, you might be able to see that this is a trick question. There is not a single layout that provides the correct view of any graph. Um, it is simply not possible. Any meaningful graph is, is multidimensional and cannot be squeezed correctly down to 2D. So um, one of the ideas about GGRAPH is that it makes it very, very easy to try out different things. And I really, really want you to get into the habit of trying out different things um, to kind of convince yourself, well, if this is a trend across all the different layout algorithms that I that I throw at it, well, then then it might be uh, okay to say that that this is an actual thing in my graph that I can do conclusions on. But if it's not, then it's probably uh, it might it may exist, but it can also just as well be uh, a fluke based on uh, on a single um, layout algorithm, right? Um, before we just saw some of the, um, some of the different kind of hairball style, uh, visualizations, um, we also saw that trees are often visualized different than, um, than the more classic networks. Um, we are used to using, uh, dendrograms, but there's actually a lot of other different ways that we can, we can visualize it. Um, and, and GGREF is, of course, there to, to kind of make everything um, equal. Like it's equally easy to create a dendrogram and to some of these other things. Um, again, we just uh, take the same graph as we used before, just saying, well, we only want ally enemy um, and uh, we only want um, people that are affiliated with Shield. Um, we can see up up here. I'm talking about well. Should we figure out what are Captain America's shield connections? So enemies and allies, people and shield are part of our network now. And then we convert it to a breadth first search tree um, rooted at Captain America. So we're we're making a search from Captain America, and that search will actually create a tree for us to to visualize. And then we can see we can create this dendrogram. We've already uh, seen that using um, uh, something called circular equals true, which is kind of like um, using uh, cord polar. But cord polar will do a lot of things that we don't want when you just want the, the layout to be circular. Um, we can also visualize this as a tree. It might sound like the same, but it's it's not we can see um there's also something called a tree map we can do circle packing like just showing all this to, to show that there's a lot of different ways to show hierarchies and trees and ggref is available to show a wide range of, of different uh visualization types in the same way that ggplot2 is um is is can be used to create a lot of different uh, visualization because it's a it's a theoretical API that just maps to any type of visualization that you want to use or create. <coughs> um, so um, just let's just try just so you can see some code. We're already part of our way there, as you can see. We tried different. Um, different edge types, also all of this just using the dendrogram layout. Let's see if we just say circular, oh, circular equals true. We can see that, that the nodes will just be like wrapped around in a circle. Um, and we can see that this, this bent edge type uh, looks slightly different now to accommodate for the circle. If we use the elbow edge type as before, we can actually see that we get this um, 
there's curvature on only the um, only one part of the of the curve so we get this uh, this look that we're used to we can also try just for kicks to use what's called diagonal um where we get this more i wouldn't say it's prettier right now but but get this more organic feeling um so that's one way to 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 look at a dendrogram what if we did a circle a circle pack now circle packing is is different because usually with trees we only show the edges but with circle packing and tree maps for that matter we we're not really drawing the edges because the edges is implicit in containment so here instead we'll draw some nodes and we'll draw geom node circle i believe yes as we can see geom node circle knows to to take up the the right dimension of the circle from the layout um and it creates this like uh layered um um how would you say just a second that makes more sense okay so um very very easy to go from something that resembles a tree to something that resembles a containment um based tree representation where you can see that this node these two nodes are grouped together because they are part of the same circle grouped together part of the same circle now is this a perfect visualization of this data not at all i would never use it but just to show that the api is able to accommodate for very very different representation visual representations of the same graph type and the amount of code needed to change is, is very very small and it's the same kind of api you use for it all right okay then the last set of uh visualization types i'm just i'm going to show you is um just to show that beside trees and node edge diagrams there's a huge variety of different ways to visualize networks um there's a lot of research into it because it's it's still an unsolved problem how to best visually communicate information in networks because of all these issues that we've talked about um and some of a lot of these are very they end up being quite academic because it's they're usually implemented in in very specific software that no one in their right mind will end up finding and using so they, they will seldom be picked up um and one of the things that i also wanted to do with ggref was to make some of these more esoteric visualization types uh become first class citizens in the same in the sense that you can you can create them with the same api and the same way that you're creating like dendrograms and so on um oops so here we'll just see which cliques are in adventures um converting uh converting the the graph to only contain ally edges and then filtering um all the nodes away uh, for characters that were not um, part of any avenger movie and then we can i'm just creating different i'll just go through them and then we can talk about them when we visually see them so these are some very different ways of showing networks up here we have a hive plot which is a visualization approach um, meant to to make the placement of nodes more deterministic so here you you de define categories to split up the nodes by um, so all the nodes that are villains are placed here and all the nodes uh, that are either villain or hero are placed up here and all the heroes are placed down here and and so and this is one node and you can see how connected it is with someone from from both and this is the same node 
replicated over here and and um, and connected to some villains so this is esoteric it requires you to read uh probably a couple of articles to to fully understand it but it is just as easy to create this type of visualization in uh, in ggref the same is true for arc diagrams where you just uh, put out the nodes on one linear scale and and connect them with these kind of uh, huge arcs, which can make it quite easy to begin to see uh, different kind of clusters because you have a like, huge connectivity down here and, and huge connectivity from this small area to all of those over here and so on. We can also create a circular arc diagram, also called a chord diagram, which is really just the same code, except we say circular equals true. We can also make something called a matrix plot, which looks like nothing we've seen so far, um, which which actually just shows connections by having all the nodes uh, placed from here and down here, and then replicated down from here and over here. Oops. And if they're connected, you'll have a dot between between them, kind of, yeah as you would read a correlation diagram or whatever. And this type of matrix plot is actually quite fantastic to, to visually show clusters because if, if we have if we have something like this, it, it's a sign of highly connected uh, nodes in a small group. And we can see over here, you also have um, highly connected uh, nodes between this group and this group that's down there so again this is a visualization that is very very useful for a very sp particular task and it's just as easy using the same api with ggref uh <coughs> well my throat is getting sore and we are nearing the end of our two hours so i'll also jump over this this is mainly for you to to have something to to play with um and move on to my closing points and then if there's any questions we can we have a small amount of time afterwards mm. is that okay or should we take some questions now first yeah yeah it's okay yeah fine okay so this is this is the last slide um so what i hope i have been able to convey is that understanding network is in the same way as tabular data it's an iterative proce process of you gradually understanding and learning more about more about the data which will inform you about new things that you can you can figure out and that an analysis of the network and the visualization goes hand in hand you cannot just do visualization and expect you to be any of the wiser um, and analysis is also something that can benefit from visualization just so you can understand how how the data looks after you've done some done some transformations on it. Um, visualization is usually not the end goal. It is just a step to inform you and to allow you to form hypotheses that you can then um, answer. That. So all of this is actually to say network data should be treated in the same way as when you try to to investigate classic um <clears throat> tabular data you need to you need to look into it you need to formalize hypotheses and you need to test these in, in different ways and the tools used for network uh, analysis and visualization has to support that and i think that tidygraph and ggraph is is a step in the right direction for that um because they are they are designed to allow you to to very very easily um Try out information both visually and, and through computations. <clears throat> um, yes, I think this is my main points, and I will stop talking now and we can have some questions. And I'll stop. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, there is one question from Ola. Um, any recommendation to start exploring the uh, literature? So uh, yes, mm -hmm. there is. Um, 
what is her name? So there's a there's a visualization or network researcher called the name escapes me, which is is bad. But there's <clears throat> there's basically uh, two or three very very good um, sites and blogs online that that goes through a lot of the tools that I've talked about and goes through a lot of uh best practices and 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 so on and i will i will take them up and i will share them with you and hopefully you can forward it um to the participants because i can't i can't remember the url right now um but i will i will make sure to uh to take them up and and, and let you um let you have it and we can uh, share the the data and the slides as well in the same uh in the same mail um in terms of um books i i haven't been able to actually find like the one book that explains everything about network analysis and visualization sadly um i think a lot of this information is is kind of online now like it's it's blogs it's people talking about things and then if you if you dive deeper into like uh, network uh, visualization theory, then then you're you're at the grace of, of articles and and paywalls and and all of that. Sadly, but it it will usually be when you when you dig deep into like very esoteric visualization types, like new new research, and usually those are not needed, basically. So, second question from Ivis: Which functions need to use from TargetGraph to detect highly correlated groups? Um, so, groups. Can, can you um, can you maybe say what you mean by highly correlated groups? Like separate groups that look alike, or just? Um... Okay, I think you'll be writing. <coughs> Yes, uh, then he's asking also about what kind of presentation tool are you using? Um, so <laughs> I, I have never really hopped on the um, R Markdown to slide bandwagon. So this is just Keynote. Um, I'm old school like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so maybe if um how do you call it? Just, okay so these are um these are what you would also normally pick up with the community detection algorithms like i talked about with um you could let's see Oops. i'll just this is easier and faster Like everything group underscore is a different kind of community detection algorithm. <clears throat> and and they will answer kind of in the same way as everything else. They will answer part of the question. Um, one of the reasons why visualizations might be handy instead of just relying on like the numerical output of community detection algorithms is that just as with clustering of regular data, you might have overlaps of, of clusters. And, and most of these, all of those available in TidyGraph, they will assign one unique cluster to every node. Like there is, there is no, there's no room for nuance and saying, well, this is kind of in this cluster, but also kind of in this cluster. It's, it's either or. And, and, and a matrix plot, for instance, can can very very clearly show that well we have a tight cluster here and we have a tight cluster here, but they're actually overlapping because they contain members from the same groups. Um, and there is nothing in tidy graph right now that can provide this sort of duality in this output. There is probably algorithms out there that are, that are less strict. Um, a lot there is actually some in. There is some in uh, in TidyGraph where you can where the clustering is actually based on a tree, and you can define different cutouts. 
So you can, um, you can during the clustering, you can say, well, how granular do you want my grouping to be? But still, it does not allow you to, to assign two groups to one node. And this is where visualizations are sometimes handy. Okay. Um, I think you are done with questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for this session and for sharing your knowledge within our community. Uh, I, uh, I hope it was useful. It's it's been a while since I've done workshops because of COVID. So. Yeah, yeah. But I, I hope you could use Perfect. it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining us. Um, Okay, uh, so don't hesitate to subscribe to our YouTube channel to be able to be notified about our next uh, meetups. Uh, I will share with you also uh, our meetup group. So normally use this one. So we share uh, the events there. And also before you leave, you could just fill out a short form. Uh, so uh, your feedbacks will allow us to like improve the quality of the sessions that you organize. Uh, thank you all again and hope to see you next time. Thank you again, Thomas. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day.